and you just come with the big group. Yeah. That's a record for a committee meeting. Oh, yeah, I could get more votes. Tony, where are you? I'm going to have to turn it down big. Education committee meeting. To those of us who are joining us virtually as well, hello, we send greetings and we thank the board for uh, allowing us to date. Um, the education committee meeting was scheduled for August 24th, Monday, August 24th, and the leadership team asked for permission to move it to tonight, Wednesday, August 12th, so we could provide the board of directors with an update on our implementation of the reopening plan. Uh, that the Board of Directors passed uh, a little more than a week ago. Um, we thought it was important that we give you an update on where we are uh, in terms of the options that our parents have picked and, and class size, um, the number of Octorera Virtual Academy requests we've received, the number of requests we've received on the, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, and um, some other things that we would like to update the board about. So. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, right? Um, and so we're going to start with on the agenda. Um, so if you, can, if you have a copy of the agenda, give an electronic copy. No? Okay. Um, item uh, one, we would start with K to six. Um, our principals have joined us tonight, and our director of curriculum and instruction and our business manager with us. Um, in addition to Mark Patika, who's the administrator for the Aquarera Virtual Academy. Um, so we want to start by giving the board an update on K-6. Um, first of all, we could talk about the number of requests for in-person learning and the number of classrooms that we need. Any roadblocks or problems that we need? Can... I think it's Tony. Noise. I think we can I think we might be. There you go. Thank All right. you. Um, so we're going to start with K to six. The number of requests for in-person learning that we've received, uh, the number of classrooms that we'll need, 
any changes that we anticipate in terms of some of the social distancing um, or actually I should say our ability to adhere to Chester County Health Department and DOH guidance in terms of the social distancing protocols that we have to put in place. We also wanna talk K to six about the number of requests for remote learning with our staff, in addition to the number of Octorera Virtual Academy uh, requests that we've received, in addition to the leave requests. We've begun to receive a number of leave requests from staff under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. So we're gonna kick it off at the PLC Crystal Lease is with us. Crystal, I'm going to ask you to move up. Yeah, you can move up to a microphone. All right. Um, we had a leadership team meeting this morning in this very room, and the building principals were able to go through um, the charts that they created. So I'm not sure how many of the numbers have changed since we've talked this morning. Just a little bit. But <laughs> I'll draw the board's attention to the screen or to the information you have in front of you. All right, so uh, our, the administration team sent out a survey to K-6 to parents, and um, I believe we sent it on Thursday the 6th? I think it was Wednesday. Wednesday, We turned okay. it around in like 24 hours. Right, that's true, okay. <laughs> and um, so in the, the survey, uh, the, we asked parents to pick their reopening option by Sunday the 9th, and we kept it open really till the 11th. And we've had phone, some phone calls and emails since then. But if you look at the total under option one, two, and three, the total, that's of the responses that we got. There is a little bit of difference between the numbers that PS total. I'm going by the numbers in power school because I do have some parents that didn't respond. We have some students that haven't withdrawn and we have, uh, we have I'm getting new kindergartners. I got from our registrar five on Monday, 11 on Tuesday and six on, on Wednesday. So, you know, it, it, they, they come very fast at this time of the year. So based on that uh, form that went out, we had 80 kindergarten students opt for that return face-to-face, -face, which is about 59%. We had 33 students choose the remote option, which is about a quarter of the class. And we had 21 students choose the OVA option. Of those 21, I, we went through the list today, 12 have, are confirmed. So they've, had their, they've filled out the form for Mark. They have their meeting with Mark. We are still waiting to hear from nine of those. We emailed them out this afternoon. I've heard back from two. They're gonna go to OVA. So that number of students, I, I, I worry that some parents don't, um, are confused between the remote or OEA option. So um, I wanted to confirm that with parents. So we're still waiting to hear back from about seven. So the remote number might go up a little bit. That's because the OVA number is going right. to go down. Right, OVA might go down, remote might go up. So when you look at the total numbers we have in kindergarten, I can I, we have eight kindergarten teachers. We can pull two of those to do remote, which puts about 17 in the class. That means that would be 86 for face-to-face. -face. So we're looking about 14 students in the class at this okay. point. And right now, when we did the six foot, we have about room for 15 would be the max. Okay. So one of the things, so Jeannie Kasner will be joining us Monday night when the board meets. Uh, Jeannie Kasner is the director of health for the Chester County Health Department. So I think one of the things that we should do is run these scenarios by her. So. You know, so 15 was the sweet spot in terms of six feet and social distancing in a classroom, right? Um, so it's quite possible that we're going to have additional parents who want to choose the face-to-face -face option for any K-6 to class. And so we're going to want to have a conversation with Jeannie about that increased class size, six feet, you know, what are the expectations then in, in terms of, of wearing a mask the entire class and, and those things. And, th and that is the conversation that I've had with parents and staff is even though if we meet the parameters, okay, we have 14 in a class, you know, these are five to eight year olds. The, the odds of them staying still in their chair and not wanting to move around the room. So the minute, so what I've said, you know, we can take a mask break when we are all at our seats and the teacher's at the front of the room. But the minute that teacher starts to move around or somebody has to use the bathroom or go to the pencil sharpener, that kind of, 
that six foot is, is broken. So it's, it's definitely that mass break is over. Um, you know, and that's a big concern I heard from the kindergarten teachers, you know, kindergarten, we like to meet at the rug and we have a story at the rug. Okay, well, we can still do that. We can keep at least three feet if we did that, but then the mask would obviously need to be on during that. Yeah, time. so it's gonna be really important that we run these instructional scenarios by Jeannie when mm -hmm. she's here with us. So, you know, she hears that, here's what teaching and learning looks like in a classroom. You know, what, what adjustments, are, are there any adjustments that you're expecting us to make Right. And, as and then a result other, of those guidelines. One of the concerns is that we have one classroom sink. So if that child goes to that sink, there's a desk off to be close to that person washing their hands. Um, the other thing is, you know, in, a, in the group bathrooms, it's, it's a double sink. You know, can I have two kids washing their hands or do I have to do one at a time in the bathroom? And we have five classrooms sharing that one bathroom. So there are definitely some logis logistical washing your hands, honestly, needs to be built into the lunch recess schedule because it can conceivably take 10 minutes for a class to go through washing their hands. Can I, can I ask one question? Sure. Um, as far as, as again, as you, as you illustrated, you know, sometimes it's mask break, you know, break time or they have to put their masks on. Has that been clearly communicated to the parents so that they understand that? Or are they still thinking once they're sitting, you know, that their child might not be wearing a mask I think there was a little confusion in the beginning. Um, and I think if you look at uh, the Department of Health has put out some guidelines and then you have Chester County Health Department. Health Department. The Department of Health that came out June, July 1st with Rachel Levine kind of alluded to being able to take mass break. Um, Chester County Health Department really said, you know, with children that are grade five and below, you, you know, you kind of have to just, it, it was not very detailed. so. Um, I think I've, I've been clarifying it with parents as they call and certainly we had our steering committee on Monday and I clarified that with the staff because I figured as if staff is in the community, they're talking about this. You know, I want it to be clear that in the majority of the day that the students will be wearing masks. And now, Lisa, it's Brian Deacon. Um, and just, just to clarify as well, on, on the form survey that got sent out to parents, we did, we did indicate that for the return to school option that they should assume that students are going to have to wear masks essentially all day. So that was that was on that 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 form that went out. Good point. Okay, thank you, because that's good to know. So that they're again yeah. making decisions right. and they have all the information, at least the information as of today. Right. Okay. Dr. Warner, um, just when you're talking all this and you said about Chester County Health Department, did you give them like our numbers today? Because that's what I was wondering. Because yeah. you know we're looking at it. And our percentage is 0.006% of our population even was affected. So right. I'm wondering if they I've prepared Jean Kasner to answer the question about how infection is determined for us, what that infection rate is and how the health department is going to apply that. Because right now they take a countywide approach. Right. And one of the things, and so in the guidance that the Pennsylvania Department of Ed and the Department of Health released this week that I shared with the board, again, it's a countywide approach, right? So they're not looking at the municipalities that make up your school community. And as superintendents, we've had conversations with Jeannie about this. And I have prepared Jeannie for this question from all of us <laughs> Monday night. Hey guys, we, can I interrupt? Sure. We had a uh, IU webinar uh, the other day, and I had an opportunity to ask some of the people who, because she's making her rounds. Yep. Um, that's a non-starter. The, the uh, infectious rate for your own district is a non-starter because they take into consideration the transients, the professional staff transients from outside your area coming in. So uh, good luck with that. Yes, but I still, even though I know what the answer is going to be, I still prepare Jeannie for the fact that the board is going to want to hear from her as the public health director, but it was really important that she clarify that for the board and for the school community at large. Right. Um, okay. Well, Jerry, don't get your hopes up. Right. But yeah. you know, it's, it's I'll just, be pushing. It's transparency <laughs> on our part. Right. Yes. Correct. Because that's been a, a question that everybody has asked me. Dr. Can Roder someone clarify something for me regarding the mask wearing? Uh, I left there 
the other night with the impression that kids would not be wearing masks at the uh, six foot desk area when, when, when we saw the pictures in the initial presentation of the plan. Has that changed? I, I think what, in a perfect world, if the teacher was standing at the front of the room and the kids never got up out of their desk, that's the scenario where they could take their masks off. But the, the reality in a, in a K to six world is somebody always has to use the bathroom. Somebody always has yeah. to go get a tissue. Even if we put the supplies there at their desk, there's always that, even if the teacher wants to go and check on a child, everyone's gonna have to put those masks on. And that, that's Got the part. Is gotcha. Well, I, yeah, I know, I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't the, old board, the only board member that came away from that, that that was the impression we were given. The masks were not going to be required when they were in the classroom setting and only during hallways. That's what yeah. I was told. Only if we can maintain the six feet. And so what yeah. Krista just described are the circumstances that come up. Yeah, well, we, we had an opportunity to describe that the other night, too, didn't we? And we, it didn't get asked or we, we weren't told that because I've told a number of parents. They didn't, maybe that's part, part of the confusion. I've told a number of parents that the kids did not have to wear masks as long as they're in the classroom setting. Uh, and it, the only time they did is if a teacher approached their child's desk. I mean, I feel terrible about that now. Now you completely reverse gears on me. Damn it. Okay. Well, again, with Jeannie here Monday night, we can, we can clarify it. Krista, was there anything else about the PLC? Um, for first grade, I am concerned because if first grade is a larger class, so there, there definitely will be some classrooms that have more than 15. Um, right now, there are, you know, 93 that have said that they're going to return for face to face. So we're dividing that by the six remaining classrooms. And right now we're at 15.5. I'm watching the number in the remote. Um, second grade is the highest right now with 45 in the remote setting. Um, you know, when you split that in half, we're looking at 22, 23 in a remote setting, uh, you know, just starting, that's starting to get hot. It's, yeah. it's different when you're in that, when it, the upper elementary classes or the high school classes, you can have more kids, but at the lower uh, end of the spectrum, I, I worry about the attention. You know, the plan was to be able to hopefully put an assistant in the virtual class with the teacher. So if the teacher um, wanted to work with one group of students in a breakout room, then the assistant would be able to support the students who weren't with, working with the teacher right there. Um, so that will help that number, but I'm just watching that number. Okay. So the other number we have to watch too is, you know, we've, we're three weeks up to the start of the school year. And, you know, as Krista shared with you, right, the number of new kids today that we're signing up for school. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do we cap what an in-person face-to-face classroom looks like? And I think that's a good question to ask our health department as well. Um, you know, if I put 25 kids, like people are gonna sign up for school between now and September 8th. And are we turning people away from an in-person opportunity in the classroom? And what are the ramifications of that? Am I even permitted to do that under school code, given that we are public education, right? So if you're gonna offer a face-to-face -face classroom and you're gonna cap it, at what point are you allowed to turn folks away? That this is new territory that public education has never encountered before. When I, I think we're gonna see a lot of withdrawals you know, right up until school starts because how withdrawal works, they don't have to tell us. They can go register at, you know, Westchester and if nobody's working in the central office handling withdrawals, right. that's how we know they're leaving when they send us a withdrawal. Right. So it, it depends on what other districts and their office staff is, is working this summer. So those numbers become very fluid in the next three weeks. Do we know how some of the other school districts, like because most of Lancaster County it seems like it's going back at least some version of in-person, how they're handling the classroom size? Have you heard from any of them? Uh, there are only three school districts left that are opening. Well, Ox Oxford had a conversation about opening remotely last night in a work session that they had. Um, and I texted with Dave Woods, you know, today. Um, the recommendation that he's putting before his board is to open the district remotely for the first nine weeks. Um, and it's because of the number of staffing 
positions that they need to fill. Um, so there's really only three of us left. And in Chester, but Lancaster, yes. Oh, okay. Lancaster County. Um, I was like, Selenko getting around the kindergarten. They're station. doing a hybrid staggered start and, and they're splitting the kids up. So, you know, they've got a group A and a group B kind of scenario. I mean, they're all over the place west of here. Krista, just, just from a, you know, historical standpoint, at this time of the year, between now and the beginning of the year, aside from kindergarten, which I'm going to think you still get people that are coming in, how many people tend to leave and then come in? Is it, are we talking generally three people? I would say like 10 to 15. In and out in, total, in and or out. just like, like 10, 15, meaning per six grade. in and six out, or kind of? Like, what, well, I'm, I, I'm thinking back, like we have a, a first grade, like when we look at the database, we color code them sure. as they're new, or they haven't been here in kindergarten, they're uh -huh. new. I would say probably 10 maybe coming in and 10 coming out. Okay. You know, but the other thing is, I, you know, the other thing you can think about is that a lot of people were not moving, they're not moving, moving right. or, yeah. or leaving their, their house full because mm -hmm. of this. So maybe that number would be lower, but okay. it's always a gamble every year. Okay, yeah. but it's in and out. Too. Yeah. Okay. And that's what happened last year with kindergarten. We went down to seven sections because our numbers were so low. And then all of a sudden it skyrocketed and put in as the largest class we have. So, Chris, you, that, how many, how many, uh, how many kids do you think are signing up because we're offering in person? Because we're what? We're offering the in person schooling right now because I think that would be a draw for parents that want in person. And there are charter schools or other schools that are, are not opening mm -hmm. in person. Uh, I did our building numbers like 60% of kindergarten, 55% of first grade, 47% in second. If you look at the survey, K to six, I could see the graph. It was 48% which were choosing face to face, and the other 52 were. And and those mixture. those were just people that took the survey. So people right. who are so interested I, in. And I, I mean, the majority of the folks took the survey. If you look at the difference between our total and our power school numbers, but I was surprised. Uh, you know that that as and and I've gotten calls that they've chosen option one and now they want to to option two. Hmm. Yeah, they correct our registrar today. She has 21 enrollment today. So that's K through 12? K through 12. Total. Uh, we don't, I, I got six today out of that 21. We move. It's this time of year, her office is a revolving door. But we don't know what they're picking. Out of the 21, how they break out. Oh, we don't know that. I know that at the OIS between Monday morning and this morning, um, I've added three students just in two days at OIS. And that's kind of how it happens, you know, when she's able to, to put the registrations through, um, you know, they trickle in. I don't know how many it's been throughout the summer, but just in two days, there were three students at OIS. Yeah, does anybody answer Charlie's question? Uh, my question was... How many students are attracted to the district because we are offering an in-person option? How many are we getting from charter schools way back? Oh. I don't know. I don't. That, I, I have one homeschool parent that came from the charter. On the flip side of that registration, I probably have 20 homeschool parents. I'm not sure my stack yet um, that were our students. And there's some of them are already taken out, but there's probably a good I would say 15 that are in these would be in these totals, but they would have chosen most of them, I believe, chose the homeschool option. And I can't speak to that because the, all my influx of kids that are coming from our incoming K, right. I haven't received a lot of additions from first and second. Yeah, I don't think I. I mean, if I have, it was one was from Westchester, one was from. Charlie, I can actually answer that a little bit too, because in my numbers, I have three that are coming back from charter school that are actually registered with the OVA that have not registered with the district yet. So we're working through that. I just emailed uh, a couple parents today about that. So we have three coming in from charter to OVA. Sorry, I was so confusing. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Um, the only thing, the other thing we want, and we'll actually talk about staffing um, the uh, preliminary inquiries we've received under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, but we just also want to just make you aware on that chart as well. Um, using the current school reopening plan, if the current FFCRA requests are legitimate, um, we're going to have at least 11 positions to fill at the primary learning center. We started a week and a half, two weeks ago. Okay. Are the 11 positions all because of the FFCRA or some of them like break down? The, some of them already. The majority in. are. And um, I mean, there's, uh, there's a couple that are, might just be there already or in the in process. Yeah, they're extending so the of the 11, eight are related to the Family First Coronavirus okay. Response Act. Okay. So more, eight, yeah. I said the other three are. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you. That helps. All right, Brian Deacon, I think you're on, right? Are you on with us, sir? I am here. All right. Um, can you share with us um, similar information for the elementary school? Yeah, so I, I, won't, I don't think I, I, well, I can read the numbers to everyone. So in terms of uh, third graders, we have 96 opting for in-person. Now of those 96, um, 31 did not respond to the survey. And on the survey, we indicated that if, that if they did not respond, we would assume they were coming in person. So potentially 96 coming in person, 50 online uh, with an Octorera teacher, 18 Octorera Virtual Academy, and four homeschool. Uh, fourth grade, we have a total of 156 kids enrolled, um, 70, 76 students um, coming back in person. Of those 76, 59 had responded, um, 17 did not. And again, we're assuming that they're coming in person. So we're assuming 76 in person, 53 online with an Octorera teacher, 23 for Octorera Virtual Academy, and four homeschool. Um, now, as Krista said earlier, um, we are getting some, some parents emailing or calling to change their, their um, preference. Um, they've thought about it some more and they're, they're, they're changing their minds. So the numbers do fluctuate by one or two a day, um, either way. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of the Octorera Virtual Academy, as Krista said, we're, we're gonna be reaching out to those families to make sure that they understand what they're signing up for. And potentially some of those Octorera Virtual Academy students may uh, turn into to choosing online with an Octorera teacher. Um, but with that being said, with those numbers currently, uh, we're looking at 96 students, in-person students in third grade divided by five sections because I need to allocate two, two of the seven for online. That leaves us with about 19 students, 20 students in a class uh, for third grade in person and uh, 76 in-person students divided by five sections. Again, because I need to allocate two of my seven teachers to online. That would be about 15 to 16 students per class in, in fourth grade. Um, I went down today and, and repositioned uh, some desks in a fourth grade classroom and third grade classroom at three feet apart because I knew that 12, 10 to 12 was, was probably was the number at, at six feet apart. And right there, my numbers are, are exceed this, definitely are not within the, um, the six feet range of social distancing. So at three feet, um, at three feet, I could get maybe 15 students and 15 desks in a third grade classroom and maybe 18 in a fourth grade classroom. Again, that depends on the number of um, small group, uh, small tables in there for small group work, things like that. But 15 and 18 are probably um, the max number of desks I can get at three feet apart. Um, any more than that, it's going to reduce that distance, of, that social distance to two feet between students. So that's kind of where we're at at the elementary school with in-person numbers. The third grade classes are configured a little bit differently. They have a closet that kind of takes up some of the the square footage of the class. So that's why the numbers are a little bit different in third and fourth grade in terms of how many desks I can fit in there at three feet apart. And so when uh, Jeannie Kasner is with us on Monday again, we would have to run that scenario by her, right? Um, because it appears that we can't ensure the six feet 
in and, terms of fourth grade. And so in, in my, in, in, the, in the elementary school, as it stands now with numbers and desks being three feet apart, um, and again, looking at the numbers, I wouldn't even be able to get desks at three feet apart in a third grade classroom. We'd be looking at, at less than three feet. Fourth grade would be close to about three feet, but nonetheless, they're gonna be less than six, so they're gonna to have to wear masks all day unless uh, teachers take students outside for a mask break, something along those lines. So that's where we're at. Any questions for me? The, the rest, Brian, Brian um, the rest of the building, is that going to be fully occupied at this point, do we know? Well, I don't know what the YMCA's plan yet is for, for what they plan on doing during the day. I know uh, Janet is working on, on her plan to, to reopen. Uh, we also have the, the CCIU classrooms that, are, that will be returning. So, uh, and it's, it's not so much the, it, it's the staffing too, in, in terms of, yeah. So, so I guess there's really not that many larger rooms that I can use, if that's what you're asking. That was. Okay. I mean, I was asking the other part too, but that was part of that. <laughs> so Brian, I know we didn't talk about this, but could the gym or the cafeteria become a classroom? Uh, well, it could become one classroom, but that doesn't solve the issue with, with the other six per grade level. And, and right. again, again, not knowing what the YMCA's plan is, I, I, I'd be, I shouldn't answer that. I can't really answer that for sure yet. And the Y plans to come back, correct, Jeff? Yes, they plan on coming back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the IU has indicated that that wing of classrooms that they have, they plan to come back? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Do we, do we have the ability to override their wishes because of our circumstance? I hate to do that, but well, most of the IU, I believe most of the IU classrooms are our kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the the Y again, that's our population. So, well, if I can add, if I can add, even even if we were, if even if we were able to get more rooms and utilize more rooms in the elementary school, um, we still need teachers to be able to. To, to teach those kids in those classrooms. So just become just because we would have more classrooms doesn't necessarily solve the problem because then we, we need the staff to teach the kids in those rooms. And so to get the class size down to that six feet range, right off the bat, we'd be looking at hiring one additional long-term sub for the year per grade, correct? Yeah, and I do have to rerun those numbers and see where that put us in terms of um, numbers per class and, and how far apart we can keep the desks. Okay. But yes, that would that would certainly help. Okay. All right, um, you know, the other thing we watched too, using the current school reopening plan, just as we looked at the primary learning center, um, if the current uh, request or proposed requests under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act are legitimate requests, um, we have anywhere from 11 to 13 positions that we would need to fill at the elementary school on September 8th. And my same question before, are those 11 to 13 specifically because of the Coronavirus Act or? I would say 12 of them are. 12 of them yeah. are, okay, so one perhaps yeah. is just right. already in the works. So right. that's, I just want to differentiate because we have some staff people that have, you know, put on the agenda and it was right. you know, planned before the. Right. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we have to look at total staffing, you know, as a whole, so. Right, know, I, I understand that. Yeah, I get, I get, I, just, I do want to break <laughs> yeah. down, but I understand that at the end of the day, it's, 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 yep. the number is the number. So. Uh, absolutely, and that spreadsheet has become very big. I think we're getting the, the, the wall version of the staffing spreadsheet, so Matt can keep all the moving pieces. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, Christian, would you talk about the intermediate school, please? Sure will. Hi, everybody. Um, so at the intermediate school, you can see the breakdown of, of the different options for fifth and sixth grade. Um, for fifth grade, 85 students uh, in person, um, and that equates to five sections with 17 kids uh, per section. Um, in sixth grade, we had 88 students, 
um, opt for the in-person, um, again, that would be five sections as well, or about 17 and a half students per section. Um, for the remote learning in fifth grade, we had um, 44 students, and I'm identifying two sections there. Um, I did move a fifth grade teacher to fill a sixth grade position, so I only have seven fifth grade teachers. Um, and so um, two remote and five in person um, gets us to our seven. And in sixth grade, there were 55 students who, who picked the remote. Um, that would be three sections or about uh, a little more than 18 students uh, in those sections, okay? Um, for the in-person learning, you can see that, that it's you know, 17 to 17 and a half kids per, per classroom. Um, and at the intermediate school, we fared better. We have a little bit bigger classrooms. We were able to spread the classrooms out. So I saw that there was a, a question from a parent about what the mask breaks um, would be. Um, and, and what I envision that to be is at the intermediate school, um, if kids are able to be working at their desk six feet apart for a period of time, they can, they can take their mask down. But as Ms. Mrs. Lee said before, if students have to get up to move through the classroom or work in small groups, then those masks will be on um, again. And, and, and like Mr. Deacon said, we did put that in our um, email app to families last week that, that we know that there's gonna be lots of times that the kids are gonna be wearing the masks. So um, the other thing I wanted to point out while we're on my slide here is that if you look at the bottom, um, the total, you can see in fifth grade, um, on Monday morning, that's what I was speaking to, was speaking about before, Monday morning there were 150 kids, um, and this morning there were 151, and we got three in sixth grade. So you can see um, that's, I don't know what those parents prefer, and I haven't, I haven't reached out to them yet. So I do think that between now and the start of school, it will fluctuate a bit. Christian, what did you say was the max amount of students per classroom you could fit with the six foot requirement? Um, 22 students per class. Thank you. Yep. Those classrooms are large. Mm -hmm. That building was built in 2008. Right. Yes. It's the one across the street. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's Very large <laughs> classrooms. <laughs> Very large rooms. Okay, and, and then again, as we look at the number of uh, positions we need to fill, um, 10 is, is where we believe we're at at this point, um, and then seven of the 10 would be uh, related to the FFCRAM. And I think, Dr. Warner, I think there's one more that I'm waiting for, for a doctor's note from, so it okay, might okay. even be 11. Okay, so this, yeah, this list changes what we know of as of this afternoon when I confirmed with Matt, whatever time that was. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, Mark Fatiga is with us tonight. I just wanted to give him, uh, ask him to give you an update. Uh, he's been very, very busy with a, with a core K to six group of team his team um, interviewing par parents and kids and, and helping parents through the registration and the onboarding process for the Octorera Virtual Academy. Um, this is K to six. So Mark, if you want to share an update. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as of right now, I know Krista sent an email out today. We went from 92 students at the elementary level to 97 uh, since that email went out at like four, I guess. So we're at 97 students at the elementary level. And I know once Christian and Brian send that email out clarifying, I know that number is going to go up a bit. Um, so we're looking at maybe 120, 130 elementary students. What's the average cost of an OBA student now? Uh, it depends on what option they choose, Mark. Do you have this? So, yeah, so average. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so the the average cost, Jeff, of an Octorera Virtual Academy student? Um, well, for the secondary, uh, 4500 to 5000 and it could be more. Um, elementary, depending on uh, what grade they're in, what they're doing, anywhere from, uh, I think it was around 1200 to 2100 um, So far, uh, 
I just talked to Mark this morning about it. We have about 160 to 170 kids signed up in that program. Uh, so we're looking at well over 450. I was going to save half a million dollars. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, currently, cur currently total total students K to 12, we have 174. I expect the high school students will uh, really start to realize that school's starting soon, and that number always creeps up the closer we get to school. So my anticipation, we had about 146 high school students last year. Um, so my assumption is we'll, we'll be close to that, taking a one-off course, a blended programming or full-time option. Um, so I'm probably looking 250 kids, maybe close to 300. Yeah, so I think that's, and we heard from a couple of the principals, I think that's important that you guys reach out to those families that have selected OVA. They may not have clearly understood um, what that option meant. And um, we've got the uh, remote with after our teachers. And that, that, so, that, those choices may be confused. Yeah, and Mark, so, Brian, yeah, yeah. Mark, if you want to answer that. Yeah, I can answer that a little bit. Just to let you know what the process has been, uh, as parents register, um, and we put that out around August 3rd, somewhere August 6th, or maybe, um, we sent emails to all those parents that had registered at that point with the Virtual Academy, and we set up individual meetings, and we've been in meetings eight hours a day, 35 minutes a shot, um, and that's a really important thing for us because a lot of parents, even at that time, have a lot of questions about um, what's happening. And one of the questions that's coming up is a little bit of the confusion between remote and, and um, you know, the virtual, uh, you know, synchronous versus asynchronous options. Uh, and really, we're, clarify we're clarifying that in the meeting. Now, given the numbers that were shared tonight um, from Krista, Christian, and Brian, of, of parents that did not get the option to sign up for that individual meeting, um, we want to ensure everybody has the opportunity to do that. Um, we're running out of time because literally we have four weeks of meetings, Monday through Friday, eight, eight to four, um, from here until September 3rd, uh, working through all the different buildings. Um, and I'm really concerned about those numbers that didn't have an opportunity to sign up. Um, we're talking about doing great, uh, a K to six meeting with all the elementary principals, um, Beth Patika, myself, um, and some of the school counselors from each of the building. So each parent um, can attend that meeting and we can answer that in those meetings. So we will address everyone that registers with the Virtual Academy about the, um, you know, the, the remote versus um, OVA option. So that, that, is, that is a point of on our agenda. So great. Thank you. The, the, the one other question I have, do students have the, the uh, opportunity to take like one or two courses in the OVA and the rest remote at ours? Yes. And when they do that, I'm assuming that we're paying like per course or is there a reduced rate to do that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, they can. So, so I, okay, I, I heard most of that. Um, so per course, we, we actually have, we offer uh, three different options. Uh, we offer a one-off course, a blended option, and a full-time option. Obviously, those three options work really, really well at the secondary level, especially the high school, where a student can get a course and they're fit to fit into their schedule. That's where they take the one-off course. But what we're finding is really at the elementary level, we're really offering, um, you know, we're offering whatever the parents really want. I mean, you know, you take the K to two, the only thing that's really required is mathematics and language arts when you get to third through sixth grade um, through OVA anyway uh, through through three through sixth grade uh, the four core contents are offered and we have electives that that can go on from there so certainly um, we have some parents choosing a homeschool option and all they want to do is math through, through the virtual academy and we can accommodate that thank you mark have you uh, have you had a lot of parents coming from or students coming from other cyber charter schools? Uh, the three students that I alluded to earlier are not cyber school students, but they are charter school students. So I haven't had anyone coming back from the cyber charter. 
And conversely, have we lost any to cyber charter? And, and what do you think that number would be? I, I, to be perfectly honest, I, I think others can answer that question a little bit better, but I've only seen one possibly, and we reach that. We reach out, so we have a process. So Cheryl Todd, when, when they have a withdrawal to a cyber charter, we reach out to that family to let them know that we have a program, an in-house program, and you know, to let them know what we have to offer. Great, and three back from a regular charter is just as good. Yeah. You still yeah. have to pay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any additional questions for K6? All right, we'll uh, transition to seven through 12. Mike Brooks is uh, with us tonight. Hi, Mike. Good evening. All righty. Um, so one of the conversations that we've been having as a leadership team is the hub. Um, one of the challenges that we have with the hub right now is that everybody wants in, all 1,000 want in the first day. And that doesn't solve the challenge we had in the first place with 1,000 students and, and 100 plus staff and our ability to social distance all those folks uh, in, in a school this size and, and manage the traffic and manage the risk and reduce the risk. Um, so, you know, Mike and his team, they've had a lot of conversations and Mike, if you want to update the board on where we are. Yeah, so we're in a little different boat than, than the elementary, you know, we are going remote um, and, you know, we begin as soon as the, the board meeting uh, on after the board meeting on Tuesday, we started the discussion of regarding the hubs. Um, we met with our building level steering committee and the, the main issue, one of, one of the main issues that come up um, is the equity because as soon as everybody saw hubs every we started to feel questions. How do I get my child in the hub. When can I get them the hub so they can come to school and you know initially the hub was um, for. IEP students, 504 students, the our ELL students. Um, but, you know, everybody has a good point of why they need to be in the hub, uh, um, you know, and it's, it's very hard to provide the equity when, you know, if it's just not those students who are, need some extra support, but what about the CTP students? What about the AP students? What about the, um, the, um, arts students, what about music, what about other elective areas? They all have um, valid reasons to um, be part of the hub. Um, so, you know, we begin to have those discussions and, and what we find is difficult um, to decide. Um, so one thing we began to discuss and we started to discuss this with our building level steering committee is that we take a tiered approach to the hub. Um, so hubs wouldn't have start on day one. So hubs wouldn't start on September 8th. And, and, and honestly, you know, starting hubs on September 8th, if you bring in the IEP uh, 504 and ELL students, that's over 200 plus students. And they would just be getting started um, with their classes. And a lot of the classes, it would just be the orientation, um, you know, getting to know the teacher, going over the expectations of classes. Um, so our goal is to get the remote um, part of our learning plan up and running. Um, and then what we're asking is, and our plan is um, to at the four and a half week period of the nine weeks, we go in and we take a look at the data and we um, see what students are in need of a hub. Um, and then we begin that tiered approach where those students based on the data who are in need of support in the hub, those are the ones we reach out to, those are the ones we bring in. Um, and then once we have that established, we go back and look at the data again, and then we begin another tiered approach. Okay, what hub is next? Is it the CTP hub? Is it the AP classes? Is it the elective classes? So we, we use the data to kind of drive um, what the hubs are and, and when we offer them. And also out there is our ability to staff the hubs. And that's a big question the, if we're actually able to staff the hubs. How many, how many of your staff, Mike, participated in that building level steering committee meeting this week? Oh, oh I could tell you we have on that committee, I have the paper here. 
50, at least 16 to 17 we're in on the call. Right, right. And there we, had a good, we had a good cross section of all, all areas. Okay, good. Because that was the next thing I was going to yep. ask. You know, when you look at the 16, 17, 18 people that you had in that Zoom room, um, you know, what walks of school life? <laughs> what all, all walks, places? all walks from grade 7 to 12. Okay, good, good. So that, that helps a lot. And mm -hmm. in that tiered approach, Mike, they gave you advice on where they would like to start. So what was the first group when you folks talked about the tiered approach and using a data-driven decision-making process? Well, it's going to be based on the data we get. But once we get rolling and we see where kids may be struggling or kids who may need that extra support, and it could be for academic reasons, it could be for, um, you know, the socioeconomic reasons, or maybe they're just the, the lack of uh, the Wi-Fi or access at home. So there could be various reasons why. And that would be that first group of students we um, take a look at to bring into the hub. Okay. Um, let's talk about special ed for a moment. So, Cal Hillbold is with us tonight. Um, Cal, if you want to come over to the microphone, because we're going to play what ifs. <laughs> All right. So, special ed, K to 12, right? Um, if we're staying with, this, with the current plan and K to 6 is back face to face, right and special ed is remote or um, 7 through 12 is in a remote scenario um, that means special ed 7 through 12 would be in a remote scenario at first correct all right any concerns with that so everything that we have is going to be a learning curve um, the level of concern is really what development can we give the staff whether we're back face to face with six foot distancing or masks or if we're looking at remote options or OBA options, we do have to train our staff on the most appropriate way to deliver specially designed instruction, that direct instruction towards a skill deficit, but also we have to teach them how to interact with their regular education counterparts. So we do have to teach them how to help the regular ed teachers modify and adapt their content, how to modify and adapt their assessment, understanding that there is not a face-to-face -face, um, tangible piece of material that will be on a desk in front of a student. That, that, that's probably the initial learning curve. And then the other half of it is looking at the human side of the student, knowing that our students that do have exceptionalities require a certain level of care to help with understanding and feeling safe to take risks in a school setting to then grow and learn. So we have to make sure that we're meeting those needs as well. Um, parents have been reaching out. It, it's been daily phone calls, much like my counterparts have discussed that you know, uh, our families want to know what it might look like. And all the conversations that I've had have really been playing out what school may look like in generalities across all of those different options that have been discussed tonight. And the big thing that I've shared with families is the Department of Health's concern, Chester County Department of Health's concern, which is if we have two confirmed cases, that now constitutes an outbreak and we are going all virtual. Uh, it's something that I don't think we necessarily hit on from my, my counterparts, um, but I think that, that that's definitely a concern parents have or that's influencing their decision when they're looking at OVA versus, versus remote versus asking for live in person. They're looking for something that they know is going to be consistent. And I think families, and Mark, you can jump in on this if you'd like, but families are communicating that that might be their piece of consistency, that they know what they're getting from the beginning. Um, regardless of what the accommodations and modifications might look like, or regardless of what teaching and learning might look like, they have something that they know will carry them through this first semester of school, and they won't have to wonder what happens if we hit that, that two-person confirmed outbreak, and now we have to come back and rethink our plans as family. So when I have the conversations with the parents of our students in special education, it's not even so much about how are you going to meet my kids' needs, it's what's gonna happen if. And yeah, I, I can't give them any concrete answer other than we're going to adapt and overcome and make sure your child gets the best possible education that they deserve in their IEP. Um, but that's where the background of our conversation is coming and that's exactly where we're pointing those conversations so that people have some level of confidence that the district is making a plan. Can I, can I ask a question, Kel, how, what, I understand your concept of them asking the question, what's going to happen if, how is that answer going to change from September 8th to November, I'm, getting, I'm making dates up here. You know, what's going to change that, that for that special population, 
that they can't come in right away? What's, what's, how are you going to, you're not going to be, how are you going to answer that differently? I don't know if I quite understand. And you're saying wanna... like, For the what ifs, what are we waiting for? So I don't think it's that we're necessarily waiting for anything other than knowing what can we do as a district and where are we planting our flag? Um, that's, that's the big thing. Marry that with the conversation that we've had earlier of how many teachers or how many of our staff are going to be pursuing the FFCRA or FMLA leave as a result. Um, it, it's, and again, I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit down a rabbit hole and I hope to come back to the, the purpose of your question. But going down that rabbit hole, teachers have reached out and they said, hey, I know I have regular ed or other subject area counterparts. Am I going to have to teach something other than special education this year? And we've had to have the conversation of, we can't answer that right now because we don't know what those numbers are going to be. So yes, our hope is that you will continue to teach your discipline that you're used to teaching, but we also need people to be open to change that a learning support teacher who primarily only serve learning support through the day in an itinerant fashion may have to pick up an extra responsibility if they do in fact have a high school English certification or an elementary education certification. So we're talking about some of that shuffling and it does leave it open for what's my daily responsibility and that's the counterpart of the parents question of what's my child's education going to look like. So what is it going to look like? We're standing firm with every service that's listed in the IEP will be met services will be delivered no matter how we have to do it virtual in person remote ova we are going to teach to the skills that need to be taught and we'll progress monitor to whatever that area is um but we we've been very clear with parents that i can't promise them exactly what that delivery is going to look like until they make a choice until we have you know that firms that firm position as a district as, as to what education is recommended to look like as a whole Okay, because I, I guess my, my question with special ed is, and again, it's maybe maybe describing more that if, if our learning support students are going into the regular classrooms, that would be challenging, and I can understand what you're talking about. So are there any special education classes that are self-contained, that they're not going into a regular classroom, and why would they not be able to be brought back remote if they are in case, if they are actually classes like that. So our students that are in self-contained classes, for example, our um, intermediate unit classes, they're cross district, they're staffed by an intermediate unit employee. Um, that, that's going to come back to the same question of what are our numbers? How can we meet those needs with the space that we have? I don't see any reason why we couldn't get that instruction up and running, but again, it has to match the continuity of the district. For our students that are in an itinerant level service plan, they're mostly participating in regular education classes and they're being supported by a special education teacher that pushes in either to the physical classroom space or that pushes into the virtual classroom space. Those staff members can still get into those areas. Um, I don't know if Brian or um, Krista or Christian wanna go back and talk about if they included that extra special education teacher in the classroom and they measured for numbers for students or if they measured for an instructional assistant being of the humans that can occupy the space. Um, but that's definitely something that would be considered when we're looking at the face-to-face -face option of, you know, by adding those, those teachers into where they need to be, are we now changing how many students can fit into a physical space? If I talked around and I didn't hit it, ask it again. I, I, I think it's just the frustration that we've talked about of getting our special ed kids back as soon as possible. So now hearing that it might be a month out is the challenging part. I, I totally understand what you're saying and appreciate all the intricacies of everything that we've just, you know, for some of the standalone classes and, and you know, those students seem to have been at least, I, I shouldn't say I can't speak for the high school level, I know for the elementary, you know, K through six, they've struggled, you know, with, with the virtual format so it just seems that that's a long time it, I, so I agree the emotional side if i'm going to cash out and just look at my sheer emotion making decisions without the data that that affects the building is 
this is the group I'm fighting for the hardest. This is my passion in life. This is who I'm advocating for the principles that we need to meet these needs. Um, it was the absolute purpose behind the hub. The hub idea was born out of this population of meeting their needs as soon as we possibly can. Uh, th there's in no way anyone, it, it, out of all the counterparts here, um, on Zoom or physically in person, every single person agrees that this has to come first, um, meeting the needs of, of this protected class of students. And that's been our, our conversation when we have our admin committee meetings is, you know, what about equity? And my stance is equity is out the window when we're dealing with protected class. Right. This is, the, this is what we must do. Um, so uh, there's not a plan per se that anyone's saying special education must wait a period of time. It comes back to the data side of can we meet the needs and what can we do in our buildings with the staff with appropriate spacing. But yeah, yeah no, we, we want this to be the absolute first thing to happen for every child because that's where our protection of, uh, as a district comes from. And that's how we meet the needs of our most diverse learners. No, that, that answers it. I just, I, it's, it's a question you're going to hear. So I just wanted you, I just wanted to be able to understand and defend your position there. So thank you. You're welcome. And from a, from a staffing standpoint at the junior senior high under the FFCRA, um, based on information that Matt Furlong and I received from the Ocuera Education Association today, there's at least 10, 10 employees assigned here to the junior senior high school that might be impacted by the FF CRA. So. Um, I just got one quick question about the hubs. Do you feel four and a half weeks might be too long for like there's a kid really struggling with the online and if they got to wait four and a half weeks to come oh. in, they could get really far behind. We'll, we'll be monitoring that with our um, with our IST and, and our special education teachers. So I, I used four and a half weeks as, as a midpoint of the first nine weeks. Um, we see a kid really struggle and it could be sooner than that. Uh, you know, so again, it's flexible, but again, it's working through the plan of uh, being able to staff it and, and, you know, just working on other details also. But again, our, with our counselors, us, the, our IST, our special education staff, Kale and Amanda, you know, we see kids struggling and we can, you know, it's four and a half weeks is just a time period of that seemed good halfway through the first nine weeks. So we're going to have good data, uh, you know, on students turning to work, turning to assessments, having grades, attendance, you know, engagement. So we would have a good hold on, you know, really where kids are struggling. Yeah, because I was just thinking about like seven, six, you know, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. I mean, these once a 14 year old at home without a parent mm -hmm. and you're saying it's all gone. I mean, I could see. Yeah, wait a month. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. And if I could elaborate on something that I don't know that I necessarily discussed in our previous meetings, and I know it hasn't come up this evening, but in looking at how we're going to meet the needs of students who may be struggling, when we look back at the, with the world of continuity of that this spring, when, when we were operating differently than what we're planning for today, in, in that continuity of ed, we weren't permitted to conduct evaluations, special education evaluations to determine if a child does have a disability and if they are then qualified for special education services. To overcome that, regardless of what limitations we have for time and space, you know, the box that is school, to overcome that, we purchased licenses that will allow our school psychologists to conduct all of their assessments to determine eligibility for special education gifted in 504 that can be done remotely. Um, so with our school psychologist here and with a student in their home, if we're not able to be in the building. But we also have the ability that they can now interact from a further distance and they can use technology by, by way of the Pearson portal. That's called Q Global and Q Interactive. That's something that we've purchased so that we can work on that screening and address those needs and students don't have to just wait or families don't have to just wait for their child to be evaluated. That can now happen. And that will then allow our interventionists, like Mike was just saying, to get in and start working. And then the interventionists are what guide the information that will go into that assessment report. Follow up kind of on Jerry's question on the hubs. And I know all of these decisions are difficult, but at some point we got to make a decision. Can you, can you kind of weed out, and maybe that's a bad word, some of these requests that may be a little uh, specific to a certain group or to a, a you know 
just include this group or just include that group? Can we just make three or four groups and say, this is how we're gonna start the year with the hubs, we'll evaluate. I mean, I keep hearing, we get data, we're gonna evaluate, but we gotta make a decision at some point where to start and then evaluate. I would be more than comfortable looking at our student services director and principals of our school saying the first hub group is special ed. Anybody yeah. with a legally defendable IEP, IEP. And, and that IEP team says that student needs a hub because there is a legal reason behind it, right? Yeah. So I have no problem with that at all as long as I can staff it. And, and some of the HR questions that, that have been raised, you know, those are some things that we want to address with the board tonight as well. So I'm on the record of saying first hub, special ed. Right. Um, if we can staff it, September 8th. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I was thinking the same thing is we have to say which ones are coming in first. We can't let the, I mean, it has to be done by you and, you know, Kale as the qualified folks to be able to say who's coming back first. And, and I totally agree with that. Yeah. And if we can include the 504 plans in that and the yes. ESL students in that, but we, we have to look at that. How, how much can we take on at one time? Cause that's, uh, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, I mean, we can't, it, it can't be, yeah, I, I, I agree completely. And it has to be told to parents from the get go. These are the, yes, these are the kids that are coming back first. And then, you know, the next group and the next group and the next group. And that's, Oh, that's what that's what parents need to know that this is how it's going to work. It, it, it's important to discuss. And I know that we talked uh, at our last meeting about gifted education and 504s, and, and as well as our ESL students and what those returns could look like. And uh, I did mention that I was remiss for not including gifted education in that presentation. But in thinking about it a little bit more, and then speaking with some of my counterparts in the county. Um, other districts are talking about, well, if we bring this subgroup back, you know, this is also the gifted group, for example, is one of our most resilient groups that we could push out, enhanced content, applied analysis content, looking for the additional content through the internet. That's one of our greatest groups that can access that. So if we're looking at it from a school safety perspective, you know, health and safety, um, not danger safety, but health and safety, um, it, it does help us to understand where our tiers come in then when we look at um, section 504, section 504 is a guarantee of accommodation, which is giving access to an environment. It's not direct instruction. So that's what separates 504 from special education. 504 is a disability, but you need something to help you access the environment where special education is you have a disability and you need a direct instruction to go with that environment. So 504 doesn't necessarily have an instructional component as much as it has an accommodation for your environment. And that's going to give us a little bit more leeway when we're talking about how many students, what does the building look like for bringing those groups back? Um, not to say that I wouldn't want to incorporate those subgroups of students, but moving special education as our, as our protected class first, ESL, ELL, ELD, uh, as our second group, and then moving to gifted and then 504, if we had to truly tear out by subgroup, that decision could be 100% defensible and saying mm -hmm. how we arrived at the decision of, of who comes first in the equity conversation. How many is it in, how many students K-12 do we have in the first IEP group? So K-12, to um, we have approximately 432 students in special education. Approximately. Say approximate and then I give you the specific yeah. number. Um, yeah. Just throw another kind of monkey wrench into it. The kids are in the career technical if they're not in the hub, are they going to have to, okay, once your last class is done online, take off and run the school real quick? I mean, how much um, leeway is with that? That's yes. why I was kind of curious because someone could be living, you know, could be right. half hour, not half hour, well, it could be half hour drive to yeah, school. Yeah, and then the, the kids that are, that are also being brought back to school on a bus that are attending a TCHS in person, how are they going to get to their asynchronous class? We can answer those questions. Like Lisa McNamara is with us, and I know uh, both Lisa and, and Mike have had a lot of conversations with the administration at TCHS. Yes. 
Well, um, I, you know, I've been on the phone with Ron Wilson um, several times in the last few weeks. And um, at this point, you know, we talked about the schools that are, are going there and then, oh, I'm on the big camera. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the schools, sorry. Um, and the schools that um, are going fully hybrid. And the thing is, uh, you know, I again, look at the equity issue. If we're going to be sending students to TCHS, then how are we going to talk to our student or t our own program in career and technical education at Octorera? So um, if we go, you know, whatever the choice is right now, K-12 or K or 7 through 12 is, you know, um, virtual, then our TCH students go virtual. Uh, and then we work at that tiered approach and getting them back into the programs because that would be the same for our career and technical OAC TEP students. Um, you know, we even talked about, okay, well, what about students that can drive? Uh, and I talked to Ron about that. And that's another big equity issue because if we have students in HVAC, for instance, that we have a student that is two seniors that can drive and four students that can't, then where's that equity issue right there? And we really put ourselves in a bind. So, and, um, you know, after conversations with Ron, you know, I think he's in agreement with that as well. So they're willing to support Octorera with that remote learning and then that tiered approach. Um, you know, I'm with Kale, you know, I think, I believe special education is first. I'm gonna fight to make tooth and nail to get um, career and technical education be the next tier because these kids are hands-on learning. I'm meeting with my staff tomorrow in a, in a Zoom meeting to, um, tomorrow to talk about how we can make a CTE hub work and bring these kids back. So, so what you're saying, Lisa, is um, if a student is enrolled in the TCHS, and um, Octorera is virtual, that student is not afforded an opportunity to attend TCHS in person, even though they are having class in person because Octorera says we're virtual. If, if, what, the, what TCHS, Charlie, what TCHS is doing is they are abiding to what each school district is doing. So if, if you know, there's only, at, at this point, there's only two schools that are going hybrid and they are questionable at this point. Okay, well, three, including us, and, and we're not sure we're even, not even hybrid, excuse me, but if we were bringing kids back in a hub situation. Um, and they're doing what school districts are doing. Now, you know, one of them is Unionville and Unionville is just pushing back their school date and they're on a six day rotation cycle. And the other one is Oxford and Oxford's on this um, AB, day, you know, kids are coming back Monday and Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, you know, it's. So, so, so what you're saying is, still, uh, um, what you're saying is they're, they're going to have an in-person class at TCHS. Can we participate? Can, if our, if our students, even though we're starting the school year seven through 12 online in a remote scenario, if our TCHS kids want to attend, in person in TCH at TCHS, will Ron Bauer permit that? Or I'm sorry, Ron, will Ron permit that? He would permit it, but however, you've got to look at how he would do that. The problem is now, there's, there's two different solutions that he's given us, okay? What, he, what TCHS is doing is they're opening it to anybody. They're saying, okay, they're not gonna deny anybody. But well, what the schools are saying is you're following what we're doing, period, okay? So if a school is going virtual, the kids are going virtual until they can wean them back and whatever the process is. If the schools are saying we're going hybrid, they're going to try to go hybrid, okay? Um, are they trying to work out the hybrid situation right now? They're trying to work it out. They're not sure how it's going to work or how it's going to turn out. Now, I even talk, you know, I've been running scenarios through my head. I've been talking with Ron. Okay, Ron. So the morning, the only way we can get our kids there in the morning is if we're hybrid because they cannot social distance. Now that's when we were scheduled to go. So the only way we could even do it is if we are, are hybrid. A certain amount of kids go A day or Monday, Tuesday. The other two go Tuesday, Thursday. 
Then the problem is, what happens when the kids come back in the after, you know, after it's done, what do we do? Are we going to keep them at school or are we sending them home? And if we're sending them home, how are we sending them home? Are we going to pay for a midday bus run? Or are we going to say, if your kids go to TCHS and we're bringing them to them from, you know, there's scenario after scenario. So but really again, what TCHS is saying, they're trying to accommodate what schools are doing. And they're going to say, yes, we're going to bring your kids in if, if you want to send your kids. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is our TCHS kids are now scheduled for the afternoon, correct? Well, that's the only time that they would get full face-to-face. -face. We'd have to go hybrid if they wanted to go in the morning. Okay, and we would so, have to plan for that. Right, so their and then the schedule has to change. Their academics would be at the beginning of the day and TCHS would yes. be at the midpoint and mm -hmm. would take them through the end of the day. But again, Ron would allow us to send our TCH kids yep face-to-face -face, if the kids want to attend face-to-face -face. Yes. they just have to agree to be part of the PM class it would have to be so we wouldn't run a hybrid program yes and then again Michelle I have to be an advocate for our OAC tip then we look at that equity issue we're sending we're TCHS sending kids, kids but we're not having our own see these are the these are the challenges we have do we have the space in the OAC tip I'm sorry. We have the space in the OAC tap to socially distance. I have the ability to do some programs and not all the programs. Yes. I have the ability to do some programs. But then again, Charlie, what do we do then? You know, we have the kids come in for the periods in the morning. Then what happens to them in the afternoon? Because we're not doing an, a midday bus run. So Believe me, I have been scenario, scenario, scenario. I want them back because these kids are hands on. Um, what would a midday bus run cost? I don't know. Would we have to do a midday run? Because if, if we said, okay, if we had staffing, and this all depends on staffing. Every it all depends on staffing. Depends. I'm meeting with my teachers tomorrow. Charlie, I'm meeting with teachers tomorrow. Um, if we had the resources to hub those kids here. So, I mean, you know, scenario, different scenarios run through my head where, you know, obviously trying to get all seniors to be able to drive and then drive home, you know, support parent pickup as much as we can. And then, um, you know, what do we do with the students? Then, you know, we'd have to find a location for the students if the other parents don't pick those students up to be able to finish their online learning. And one thing you have to remember is when they're done with the OAC tip in the morning, Who's going to be with them in the afternoon? Because oh, that's what I'm if, with, if, if we can staff it and our staff is teaching synchronously, those teachers are teaching classes in the afternoon. So now we have to find a place for them and somebody to supervise them. Would it be possible to stay at the OAC TEP and take virtual classes? The OAC TEP teachers teach electives in the afternoon. So they would have students coming into those classrooms in the afternoon? No. For, well, they would teach virtually, oh. but they would be in a classroom working while the teacher is teaching virtually the other students. And but, Charlie, those are conversations, honestly, that, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm going to be bringing up tomorrow um, and talking with the student, with the teachers um, about, you know, again, how do we have a CTE hub? And, and, and talking about those things, um, you know, do students stay in your room? Are you allowed to have students stay in your room while you're teaching other electives? Um, you know, again, where do we house these students if we are bringing special ed and um, the ELL? Because, you know, now we're talking three, four, 400 and something kids. Um, and it's getting a little difficult, you know, at that point to be able to find locations to be able to socially distance. Now, are the numbers, do we know the numbers of people and students that are gonna stay? Not at this point, um, but you know, these are all things that we have to work out. Um, quick question with, um, for hubs for the, thing for the career and tech kids, I mean, we have none of the high school or anybody's coming back, so we have, all these empty classrooms. Can we put a couple kids 
in each classroom. We have, we have teachers, teachers have on teachers the classroom. Our too, staff teachers. would be required to teach from here unless they had a legitimate accommodation yeah. for the Family First Coronavirus right. Response Act. And we have I was expecting here. to teach remotely from here. And, and, and then we got a ton of them. There's only 10. I mean, we got, there's only 10 in the high school. 7 to 12th grade, there's only 10. Classroom. So there could be 10 classrooms. Mm -hmm. Unless so, we have them sub, and we, you've got a sub use in that room. Right. The students need to be supervised. Students can't be in a room unsupervised. Right. Could we contract with the CCIU to have a hub uh, at one of the TCHS build, at the TCHS building for those students? Well, I don't know why we would want to. I mean, we could certainly contract, but I, mean, I would want to try. And, issue. Right. I would want to try and solve it here with staff first. Right. I mean, I, I would want to try and solve it within our own school, within our own space, with our own staff. Uh, that would be ideal, but right. I'm just throwing yeah. ideas out there. Clearly, we're limited by staff. If there was staff that we could sub out through the TCHS, I think that's a viable option. If, if you just have to have a person sit there while the students are taking class online, watching their other teachers, I, I don't I mean. Yeah, and that could, that could be as, as simple as, as, as an aid. Right, exactly. Right? You know, so yep. we, we look at our aid pool yep. and we say, okay, you're assigned to the CTE hub. You're assigned to the TCHS hub. We, we did talk about that again. You know, it's just, I think one of the things that the high school admin team was just concerned about is the space um, with that. You know, uh, we did have that conversation. Okay, can we keep the kids at TCHS, you know, thinking that they'd be in there in the morning, but now the morning's not going to work. And do we pick them up midday? And that's another additional expense. And Okay, so if we pick them up in the morning, do we have space for them in the, you know, in the morning at, at Octorera, then be able to bus them in the afternoon and, or do we bus them and go straight to TCHS and I know now they don't have space in the AM to have kids there at all, because they're on a, they're on a, that hybrid schedule in the morning with schools. So that kind of shot that out the window. Why, why couldn't we bring them back here in the auditorium and have that's where we have our special ed or if we're bringing our IP kids back, that's where, you know, we've heard, there's only so many large locations that we have. It's all a matter um, of location and staff. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, I, you know, th believe me, Charlie, I, I've been running this through my mind and back and forth and, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak to get myself in trouble because, you know, I also put out, well, can they stay with the teachers and this, that, and the other, and, you know, um, those are, there's are the questions that have to be, I don't know if it has to be negotiated or, or compromised or what have you. Um, I'm not even sure if the teachers are going to be there because I haven't had that conversation yet, whether they're going to be taking medical leave or what have you. Um, so I have my meeting tomorrow. Um, there's no, you know, behind KL, I am 100% at for these kids because the CTE program keep these kids in school and you know I'm getting the phone calls from the parents and everything and Michelle and I are sitting down and we know how important this is you know the high school principals Mark John Mike and I we're banging our heads against the wall trying to make this happen we hear you loud and clear I, please know we're not ignoring you but mm -hmm. staffing is everything in, in all of this and you know i've shared with the board that we have 55 potential requests for leave under the family first coronavirus response act that's anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of our workforce correct right that was the percentage we talked about today matt more than half you know and then i come into a situation where i do have um you know where you know, in some of the programs, we can do this. We can social distance, we can do that. But in other programs, the numbers are too high. So I don't have, the cl and the classrooms are just not big enough. Can we use can the we, shops? Can we use the shops? Well, I've already used the shops for the other programs. I mean, they're spread out. That's how I cut it. You know, my ag production, my animal and plant science now has, it's growing. It has 21 students. That room is not capable of that of social distancing 21 students. Um, you know, childcare education now is, you know, they're at 19 and 
that lab and the whole facility, I was in there with the tape measure trying to measure it and, and manipulating the moving desk and chairs. So, you know, some programs I can absolutely social distance with, others I can't. So then what happens there? Um, yeah. Are we talking about staffing yet? Yes, because we are. My, yeah. my, I think we all need to understand though that staffing, if you're saying that there are almost 55 requests, staffing is an issue whether it's remote or whether we're here. So staffing could destroy, staffing could destroy your whole, the whole district because if they're remote, we are asking, if we're going virtual, we're asking our staff to come in and teach in the building. So if we have requests that are about childcare, it doesn't matter if we're in school or we're virtual. Okay, so I think we just need to be really clear that this re these requests for the family first coronavirus response response back. Response. FFCRA. Thank you. Is is across the board. It's it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what format we're, we're coming in. If, if you're not going to report to work, whether you're live or virtual, if you're not going to report to work because of childcare, it's going to hurt the program. So I think my point my point is that I think everybody that that the, the point is that it's a universal problem that we have to solve mm -hmm. is staffing. And we have to have that conversation to your point. Are we saying, are we looking for staff? Because the question is with the, with the act, they get 12 weeks. So what's going to happen week 13? Because week 13, you can't come to an employer and say, I can't get childcare because you shouldn't have a job to begin with. So that's not an issue from 13 on. So we're looking and saying, do we have 50 or 40 long-term subs that we need? Because we're going to have to staff for a whole year. So I'm just saying to your point, we have no staff, that if the staff aren't going to come in after that 12 weeks, potentially they're not gonna have jobs anymore. So are we? So it doesn't matter the format right now. So I'm sitting here going, before we solve any format, we right. need to solve staffing. Well, right. that's all. Well, actually what we have to decide is if this is the Boston plan or not. Are we moving forward or are we not? And that's the question that we have to answer. So let's talk That's about staff one. staffing, right? In a remote scenario. But but it's but it's regardless of whatever. It's whether it's virtual or in yeah, I know we are. That's the whole thing. So but I think but I think everybody needs to know that it's right. And but I think people need to understand that it's not just the in person part. And then, and I think that everyone listening needs to understand it's not just the in person part. This is going to put a kibosh on everything. These are for child care. Right. So it doesn't matter. But doesn't we need to. Yeah, exactly. Right. We want to be clear. We can't have them because they're going to be on the travel day. Right. So right. In a remote scenario, though, we might be able to decrease the impact because I can raise class size in a remote classroom. Right now, I can't raise class size. In a face-to-face -face classroom. Remote classroom. Well, you know, home, no, absolutely not. No, that, that would not that be the case at all. I, I can put more kids in a remote classroom. I can raise class size you and assign that. an aid. Yes, I could potentially okay. need less staff. So, so you're going to have staff that now have, and if, if you were to go virtual, you'd have to have a, all of a sudden a staff person because the person next to them isn't able to come back because they've taken leave, um, is going to have 30 kids in class. Po mm -hmm. Possibly. And we would assign an aide to that classroom as well. Now, so, you know, it's one of the advantages that we have, declining enrollment, the enrollment study that was done, right? We have small class size to start with right? We have small class size to start with. So we can reduce some of the impact of the Family First Coronavirus Response Act request by going full remote for the first nine weeks. This, uh, the event we had the other night is useless, basically what you're saying. What we did the other night was this negates it. I'm not confident we can staff a face-to-face -face plan. Then why do we even bother being board members? Because we're, we're here to represent the community. The 
parents, and that's, I'm just frustrated that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean really. Well, it's not our decision anymore. What's that? It's not our decision. It's not. Well, it's, I mean, well, what can you do if you don't have the people? Well, I guess the next point is, can we put out a request and could we staff it with 50, 40, 30, whatever the number is, let's just, you know, long-term subs that end up might even be permanent positions come next year. If I can right? find them. Because here's what's frustrating me. This little group here, now all of a sudden, because they can't get childcare, now we're going to have a thousand parents or how many of them work that we're all going to be out of a job. I mean, what we're doing to community here is unquestionable. It's just, I mean, and, I, and I we, think the I think the demand on the hubs showed um, a big gap in the data. When we asked people about coming back in person, and we said, "Oh yeah, we'll do in person," and then, "Oh, we'll have these hubs." Well. So if everybody wants the hubs, I'm thinking a lot of people wanted in person that weren't surveyed or didn't answer the survey. So I, that data was severely understated and that's- For face to face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah folks want their kids back in school. Mm -hmm. That's, that, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what that's we hear all the time. My problem is, is how do we solve it? That, that's what, because at the end of the day, I've I'm, I'm been venting for days, but we have to move forward and figure out how we're gonna solve it. And if we can pull so these, look, look for, exactly. Not, right, that's what we need I'm to do. I'm not willing to give up tonight. I, I agree, I'm not willing to give up. I agree. I'm not at this point willing to go. Now, you know, again, we're getting closer and closer. We, are, we need to do that. No, that's not the case at all. No, I, no, this is about risk, okay? If it were up to me, I would open up this school district to 2,200 kids. I want our kids back, okay? I have been trying desperately for the past four, but this, this entire team, nobody wants kids back in this building more than I do. I am trying, but I'm also trying to mitigate our risk. Here's my concern. Even if I can fill every position before September 8th, Right? right, let's consider how many qualified applicants can we secure? How many of those folks would we have hired to work with our kids if we were not in what appears to be a desperate scenario? Warm bodies to fill positions versus qualified candidates who can support teaching and learning in the classroom. Are we willing, are you as a board, willing to settle for second, third, and possibly fourth string to come in and work with our kids, just to gain face to face. As opposed to going all virtual. Look, but I think it, it's. I'm going to jump on Nico's point. Whether it's virtual or in person, this list severely hampers any education delivery. So I think I the sooner the better that we say we need to go out and hire. And as much as I don't like it, I'd rather have a second or third string than. An empty base. It'll be third and fourth <laughs> string. And, and so I, I want you to think about it. I know, it. that's what I mean. We have to do we it. We have to have I mean, a third and fourth string because we, we might not have, have that, we might, what, we're going from 50 right to now. 20. We might not have as many, right? To your point, if you go virtual yes, and you have 30, we you, can reduce you can the number. reduce it, but it's still, we're still not going to be able to staff it with who we want, perhaps, well, I don't even know who we want to staff with. So but do we, we give up tonight? Not now or Monday night. Because here's my point. Well, I think by we Monday night we have to make a decision because it's right. August 17th. Yeah. I mean, people like that, we have to. But he, but regardless, you, you still have to go out and ask to see what we can get for staff. Yeah. Because again, it doesn't for matter sure. which format. We're still, a, a teacher can't come, you know, someone that says I'm requesting that I don't come face to face because I have childcare isn't going to be able to go to a classroom either. Because here's my other question too. So you're going to ask some of these parents out here, do I want a four-string teacher or do I want to lose my job? What Guess what they're going to say. I'll take that fourth square, you know. I mean, you talk lose cost? your job. Okay, so so let's let's talk about that, right? Yeah. We're we are going to struggle to find qualified folks to be in the classroom. So you're you're looking at third and fourth string. Yeah. Okay, maybe second string at best, all right? Even if those qualified people, right? 
are, or even those barely qualified people are available to be in our classroom, how many of them are gonna work for $140 a day? That's where they're gonna have to start, right? Because that's what our long-term sub rate is because the positions are 12 weeks. They're under the 90 day mark. And let's say I can fully staff the option on September 8th. On September 8th, I have a warm body everywhere. How long can I keep it staffed? Who's to say that the warm bodies, the subs that we bring, aren't going to be impacted by COVID-19 as well? And where am I gonna find subs for the subs? How deep in the bullpen? The bullpen is, is, going, to be ex is going to be exhausted. I think at the end of the day, I've had to accept this reality. I don't like it, but here's the conclusion that I'm coming to. I cannot operate the Octorera Area School District without qualified personnel. Our job as kids it involves human interaction to ensure the safety, security, health, welfare, teaching, and learning to deliver the product called student achievement. The job requires adult supervision and interaction with kids. Without a qualified and competent workforce, I cannot produce the product called student achievement. The 55 number tells me that. In the school reopening plan, I so desperately want to put in place because I absolutely believe K-6 to deserves to be back face to face and darn it if we would all just come together as an entire school community, including the teachers, we could solve it. We could solve it. I'm convinced. But without people willing to do that, 55 is the reality check that we all have right now. I can't staff us at 55, inevitably, right? We will give it the old college try in the next few weeks, but there are going to be open positions on September 8th. There are going to be classrooms without a warm body or a qualified person there to work with kids, to protect the health and safety of kids, to protect the welfare of kids, to direct teaching and learning. And so, yeah, I'm taking some offense right now that you think I'm trying to railroad a plan. I'm not. I'm sticking up for the health and safety and welfare of this entire school community. And I'm recognizing what our limitations are. And I'm accepting those and saying, okay, let's wrap our heads around plan B. If remote learning is the way to go, then remote learning it is, and it's gonna be the darn best remote learning plan you've ever seen because the team's been working on it. The team's been working on it simultaneously for the last four months. It's now, not I'm really sorry I'm yelling at all of you right now, but darn it, it's about time. Your leadership team has been bearing the weight of this for months. Today was like a therapy session in this room. We are at our wit's end. We are so tired of feeling incompetent. We are so tired of feeling like losers. We are so tired of feeling like we're up against it from everyone. So please understand, we want our kids back. But the circumstances above us keep telling us to be patient, be creative, keep looking for ways to engage kids. 55 is a serious number. It's a serious reality. And I'm telling you, with every professional bone in my body, every bit of 20 some years of experience, I am not confident we can staff. 50 some positions, because that number is going to grow every day. Matt Furlong and Jeff Curtis and I have watched it. It went from like 15 to 20 couple to 30 couple and then boom, 55. What's it going to be tomorrow? And even if I can staff us, even if I have somebody in every position on September 8th, what guarantee do I have that coming back the next day I have a workforce. There is no guarantee. COVID-19 impacts all of us. 
Who's to say the subs aren't going to be impacted by it? And now I'm scrambling for subs for the subs. I think we're, we're not frustrated with you. I think we're frustrated with this list because I feel this list could almost, and I've been feeling that way about all the school districts. This is going to destroy communities. It's going to destroy kids. They're not going to have parents home to help them learn. I mean, we're going to leave a whole group of kids so far behind. And it's just not, I'm talking the whole deal with, I don't know, not being able to staff it. It's just, we're going to just lose a whole group of kids. And like I said, it's just not this school district, it's every right. school district. Every, and we're, every and we're going to lose district. a whole group of kids because we got parents got to work. We got kids are going to be left home to try to figure out with their grandparents or something like that. And you're going to have a grandparent there with four or five kids, you know, two or three kids trying to figure this out. And that's yeah. the shame of it. It's just. But, but we also we have to, to like take a deep breath. This isn't forever. Right. It's okay. Not, like, it's not forever. You're not going to lose. If you're talking forever. six months, you're talking eight, you're talking next yeah, March. It's going to be. I well I don't trust this. <laughs> well well I think you know you can look and say it's it's I'm going to be optimistic and say it's not forever. You are going to have some students that absolutely are going to take steps backwards, but we're going to have to address that and move forward. So I'm not going to be that pessimistic that it's that we're going to have everybody fall off a cliff. The reality of it is we can't staff it. The reality of it is this part Pennsylvania can't staff it. The, the challenge is to the west of us, I don't know if they're going to can start to have the same issues that we have. They're not having correct. the issues right now. I, I would suggest that it would probably just kind of roll across, but we have no choice. You know, I mean, I'm concerned that even virtual, we're not going to be able to do this. So we're mm -hmm. going to have folks that are going to insist that they can't because of childcare. And I'm not actually faulting any staff member for whatever reason, that's their personal reason. And, and this is not to attack anyone that is making a personal decision for their family. But the impact of that is, is that we have positions that we're going to have difficulty filling even if we go virtual. And I think we have to have that out there. And I think it has to be very evident to our staff that up to 12 weeks, our community has to know there's going to be money that's going to be spent because folks, because of the Leave Act, are going to get 12 weeks. Um, I think it's up to $200 a day. I, I can't recall, but that would be an interesting number to know on Monday. What's the financial impact? But then what happens week 13? And, and that's so, where we need to know because we might have staff members that are making a choice for a very long time. And they right. had, need to be aware that week 13, you might not, you might be knocking on the door next year, but week 13, you were done. Right. And I don't know if that's, if we're allowed to do, not even allowed. I don't know what our parameters are with the protocol. And Jeff and yeah, Matt can speak to that. Too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the child care leave part of the act is uh, 12 weeks. Um, we have 23 individuals on this list who fall under that. Their option at that at the end of the 12 weeks is to come back. They can't, they can't request another leave unless they have a legitimate illness. Um, so yeah, so you're going to have this uh, more than half of that group. Now, I, I say that now, but I don't know how many people between now uh, and, and, you know, if we make a decision on Monday, how many more people are going to come in with the sick leave. That's, uh, that's a concern we have. We have 15 people on this list that have the sick leave, and that can go on and on for quite some time. But, but you're right. We have about half of this list of people that's limited to the 12 weeks, and then they have to make a decision. Is there any uh, discussion about uh, changes to legislation that might extend that? Do we know? We're not aware. Not aware. I've asked John Lawrence repeatedly, what okay. do you think is going to happen to the FFCRA? Um, they don't know. Okay. They, they don't know. And I think in the latest round, whatever's happening at the federal level, I, I don't know if it was part of the negotiations or not. I know, I think um, the $600 a week was still part of the conversation. And yeah, and that's, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, they can so none of the and lead, the eviction, yeah. I have not heard of any changes to the lead. I have not, you know, and, and so the question is, how many leads can you pile on to this, right? So you start with that right. initial 12 weeks, and then the other leads that are available under the policy of the board and in the collective bargaining agreement, how do they impact? Yeah. And, so what, and what really 
some of the frustration that we had that, that really kind of took us surprised was the number of these leaves, we didn't know about these until the schools where these kids go to, like Westchester, Downingtown, yeah. they started going remote, then they fell into the eligibility of being uh, in the, F, uh, the FMLA because their school closed. So it was kind of like a ripple effect. And we still have a handful of children at Oxford. And if Oxford goes, then you know, I think we've already included them in the list. But so you can see as those schools started closing, then we started losing the teachers because their kids go to their schools. So the issue then was- And if I may, um, I was on a meeting today with the principals throughout Chester County and they're all in the same boat. Their staff, they don't have the staff. So we are all competing to get substitutes. Yeah. We're all, I mean, every school has, you know, 25 to 50 people that they're trying to get staff for. Well, that, that's what I was going to say too, because, you know, right, we're not the only one having to deal with this. So how many other schools are looking for long-term subs? And so the pool is shrinking and shrinking, right, for your subs. And that's why I brought up, we're paying $140 a day for a long-term sub. Yeah. There are school districts out there that pay more, that will offer. Right. So, you know. So you're saying, you know, you're saying we, we're the, the quality is just going down, you know, possibly, you know, because we have to use so many long-term subs. So why can't we somehow work with the qualified folks we already employ i you know i i see what you're saying you know there's the issue with some of the requests for leave because we're requiring them to work from the classrooms here and because we would have kids in home so that might be that that might be but but i think the staff should work from here this is this is where the resources are yeah, right yeah yeah, yeah i do agree with that yeah and our administration and our counselors and our intervention specialists and it's part of the tiered process to bring folks back folks have been away from work for so long i think there's misconceptions out there the place is so scary oh my gosh if i set foot in it i'm going to be infected no you know the cleaning has been done the sanitizing has been done the disinfecting has been done we have good procedures in place right and so part of this tiered process of getting folks back is to require the staff to work from here. Unless there is an accommodation under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, that legal counsel would look at me and Jeff Curtis and Matt Burlong and say, sorry, you're going to have to grant this. That's why legal counsel is on the team. But to build that school community, teachers need to be working from here. Everybody needs to be working from here. Although I'm thinking like if they're, if it's, if it's due to child care, then child care, then they're going they to want to be working <laughs> home. I mean, they, they're, 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 that's why they'd be concerned about even having to go to school because who's going to be there right. to monitor their young kids doing their online learn? I mean, that's kind of what I was assuming. Right. And so yeah. we really have to look at that, like, you know, because if I'm going to allow you to work from home because yeah. of child care concerns, because your school district is closed and, and the kids are learning from home as well, you know, how do I know you can give the time that the Octorera students deserve, Wouldn't right? You, if you went remote or virtual, remote, virtual, same thing, um, the why? would necessary I know the Y has some preschool, but would the Y have more openings during the day so our staff could actually utilize the Y for childcare? You could certainly I know we've started yeah. some preliminary conversations with the Y. We haven't gotten very far because yeah. they need space from us. Yeah, and they, we, we have we have talked to the Y about providing daycare for our teachers. Um, they're very interested in doing that. What they needed to know is what space we had available. We couldn't quite tell them yet because we were waiting to see how many kids were going to sign up so we could, you know, keep those yeah. socially distanced. So, but there is an opportunity for that, absolutely. These uh, schools that are closed, those teachers whose kids go to those schools that are closed, we can't compel them to go, but we can certainly provide them. Or if we were 100% remote, could they not have some space to have their own kids 
doing their remote program. I mean, I don't know, doing their remote from our school too. Put them in their classroom. Yeah, but well, or or another, you know, or an adjacent room. I mean, if we're one hundred percent remote, then we obviously have space, right? Yeah, I think there would be some insurance. We talked about that today at the leadership, <laughs> and I said, oh, I oh. our insurance would say, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, coming from the insurance person here. But it's a question, you know. I mean, that's it's still going to be like that. Still seems to be the core issue for a lot of the requests, right? Is is what are, you know? How am I going to handle my you know, my child's remote learning at home while I have to be away, you know. <clears throat> so I'll ask a really comfortable question. What if we get to September 7th and we have 40 unfilled positions or 35 or 28 or whatever that number, we have a number of unfilled positions and school goes to open them up. Like what's that sort of worst case scenario? School doesn't open? Well, the Pennsylvania Department of Ed would have something to say about that. So, so my job is to look at what our best case scenario is for making sure we are ready to open fully staffed on September 8th. And so I think it's important too that staffing isn't the only roadblock here. If you remember the word of caution slide from a week ago, right? So right now, when I think back to that word of caution slide, the first thing I had on there was that guidance and directives from PDE and DOH become more restrictive. Well, um, they haven't become more restrictive, but I think what the principal shared with you tonight, I am very concerned about our ability to, to adhere to the current guidance and directives that we have in place. I mean, the principal shared the numbers tonight, right? So I am very concerned about face-to-face -face and our ability to deliver on the six feet. I mean, you know, Brian was pretty clear with you that in his classrooms, it's looking more like two or three feet, right? Yep. That is, that is um, The next piece, right, if you remember that word of caution slide, is we do not have clear guidance and direction from CCHD and the Department of Health. Now, Jeannie Kasner is gracious and she's willing to be here like she's gone to all the schools but so we'll have her it works this can you give me some peace of mind explain that flow chart from every lens right so you think about the five people in a school that are going to be on the front line of any potential COVID-19 case, right? Well, tell me how a nurse uses this flow chart and a principal uses this flow chart. And take me through this flow chart from a parent point of view and a teacher point of view, and more importantly, a student point of view. Tell me how it all works, right? In addition to the 30 other questions we all have about the gui guidance that we've gotten. So there are a lot of unanswered questions uh, about supporting the health and the welfare of students and staff, right? So, and then you finally get to staffing. So all three of those things on that word of caution slide continue to be in play. I'm I appreciate the fact that she will be able to be here in person on Monday. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I said when I voted yes for this plan was it was on the assumption that we could fulfill the health requirements, that we could get clear protocol from PDE or not PDE, from the Chester County Department of Health. It looks like we're getting clearer protocols. So that's, I'm a little less frustrated. I'm just incredibly frustrated that even that staffing is going to be such a roadblock that it's going to impact what we do no matter what. And I, it's just to get off that right now. That, that, you know, the health issue was a big thing, but that staffing could do this to our district no matter what format is, I, I just think the public needs to be aware. I do believe we have a better chance of solving the staffing dilemma if we are remote because I have more flexibility in terms of class size and assignments and numbers. 
True, but you do. But it's still not. I agree. We, 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 we are still doing what we don't want to do, and we are, we are, we're impacting student achievement regardless. Right. Now, we're doing the best we can. And again, you, you are doing the best. I, I support the fact that the effort that you've put in with changing direction every three seconds is it's just difficult. It's just a little, I think there's a little venting. I think we're having a Absolutely. venting session and, right and, now. And no disrespect to the board. I just, I need you to know how much we all care. You know, for, for the past few days, we've all been having these conversations about how much of the personal us have we given up in the last six months mm -hmm. to deliver on the promise of the profession that we chose. You know, we're, we are exhausted. We're exhausted and frustrated, but we are still determined and hopeful. And yes, we want every kid, every staff member back. But we, we also know it's up to us to clearly communicate what our limitations are. Because at the end of the day, you charge us, right? You charge us with the product called student achievement, but you also charge your one and only employee with mitigating risk and protecting the welfare, the health and welfare of students and staff. And we can't do that face to face. Given the three things that I just went over with you, we can't deliver it face to face. Now, may it get better before Monday? Who knows? We're all suffering from whiplash because every day it's something new. We care more than you know. Did you want to move to nurse questions? Yeah, if um, if the board has some, or you can email them to me. I sent you the flow chart, and I also sent you the latest guidance from the Chester County Health Department. It's the 731 guidance that's on the website. Um, if um, you know, we can talk about those questions now. If if you want, um, or if you want to email them to me, um, I told Jeannie I would have them to her by the weekend, so she could review and. She's used to every every question. I mean, she's gotten them all because she's gone to all the schools at this point, or she's making her way around. Um, but I just thought it would be good for her to have have a heads up, and then it, that would also then allow us to kind of um, lead the conversation. Yeah, I had two. Okay. Um, I think uh, Brian answered it. I think he had to drop though. But it was, can we look at our township and borough values because we have twelve. Right. In Chester County, right. Um, but it sounds like we have to work at the county level. But I'd still like to reinforce that with her that we have mm -hmm. twelve. Um, and and what a hard sell that is, right? Because I, we're yeah. going to have parents and <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and then, is there going to be guidance about masks? Because there was the Duke University study that I just saw on the news. That there are some masks like if you just use the uh, um, the neck things, uh, or the um, or if you just use a bandana, they're not effective. So is there going to be specs on masks? Yeah, that should provide? should we be specifying certain masks? Right, right. Those because um, I think the DOH order right now, I'm pretty sure it's a generic face covering statement. Yeah. So, but now there's things that are so saying that that's not. Would that be a face covering? Yeah. 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 Sorry. What does our local C, uh, Chester County Health Department and um, Pennsylvania Department of Ed state, what are their specifications from that? Yeah. Do right. they have any? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, a Duke article is certainly, you know, Duke University is one of the best, but I'm sure you think so. You know, so <laughs> you, you got to, you just got to take that in. No, no, I know, but if, but you know how guidance changes, right? So, if there's going to be guidance on, does she think that there's going to be guidance forthcoming on what kind of masks? Okay. That the, kind of thing. the guidance, when the guidance changes, that's when we are to react. Right. The, the well, question I that I've had for her is, is um, in the protocol and in the flow chart, 
um, when when a student, and I love, you know, one from, you know, has a symptom from, you know, A and two from B, but if, you know, symptom A is a cough. So if a student comes in and is coughing, coughing, but they have no other, nothing else that, that you know, clears them, all of a sudden there's a stop sign. They get sent home, but they never say when they get to come back. So our, they're, they're our nurses did a really nice I saw, job. Cause so, of, so we use the question the guidance. Time, because that's the part. Yeah. Do they yeah. go home for a day? Do they, they have no contact? They're not positive. We're not going to make a cough, go get tested. But can they come back the next day? Yeah. Any of the symptom A group list items, the one symptom types. The other group has right. two. two. Yeah, anything really except for like a fever. Can I just give, so what, just a clarification, what are we doing from here? Are we still trying to do what we voted for and planned for, or are we just, what's happening? Because I'm sort of getting confused here. Um, if, we're, if we're just going to go virtual, who cares about what the Board of Health or well, I think. <laughs> well, the question is if we go how long, that, how like, long? That, that how long, because at some point, if we're working toward going back and again if you're looking to go virtual though are we still looking back to bring our special ed kids back like like that's part of that discussion like right. okay we still have to do something with with our high-risk students so uh, absolutely where does that all come Here's, in here it's a good question where right? i would like to head next um during monday school board meeting after the presentation from the chester county health department it is the leadership team's hope that you would entertain a presentation from us that would outline a plan that would open the school year K to 12 online remotely. Well, according to this, we currently can't do that because we don't even have staff to come in and do the virtual. Well, between Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, we I mean, would develop the plan. Have, have we had any staff? We do it. Have we had any staff reach out to us to, you know, hey, yeah, I got this idea for uh, childcare. Have they brainstormed any childcare ideas? Because I, I, I see a lot of people on this list, and a lot of them are friends, and a lot of them could watch each other's kids, or, you know, hire a. a a friend in college who's taking virtual classes to sit and watch their kids. Have they been involved in, in any type of these decisions? I mean, that no, we've just begun to receive the list since the presentation to the board a week ago. So I'm asking on behalf of the team, would you grant us the opportunity to outline a plan that would open the school year remotely? K to 12 and our rationale as to why we're making that recommendation. I think at this point it would be, and I don't mean to offend anybody at the table, it would be irresponsible for us to say no, because that's a viable option. We have to at least hear it out. Thank you. That's, that's my take. I'm yeah. I agree. I agree as well. You have to, you have to have the plan for that. You really have to plan for it. You'd have to plan for it anyway. If, if something does happen, even if we bring kids back and we're, Two weeks, three weeks in, what if we get infections? We have to be back to remote, so completely. So you have to have that plan. And, and I, I think everyone also needs to know that, that in some ways from a staffing perspective, you know, our hands are somewhat tied. We couldn't say, you know, by June 1st, we need to understand, we need our staff to tell us what their plans are. You know, it, it's not as much in the private sector where you can be a little more uh, uh, forceful with dates because you know the conversation that parents have been having and, and agonizing i know parents have been agonizing what should i do um they've been thinking about it for months and you know i have to say that our staff has had the opportunity to think about it for months they knew that we were toying between which direction and if someone had child care issues they had child care issues in june this didn't all of a sudden appear so i would hope that any staff member that, that thinks there's issues that they come forward immediately and don't drag their feet as well and come out now with it because it didn't matter. You know, we should have been, they should have, <clears throat> it's a shame that it wasn't communicated earlier mm -hmm. because they had every opportunity to do that. And I think that's just unfortunate because it's putting us in a situation that 
Um, we may have always been in, but we might have been able to plan for it two months ago. Well, you can guarantee that very early tomorrow morning, I'm going to be reaching out to the president of the Teachers Association and having a conversation about 55 names on the list. And I know I keep chiming in here, but I'll let you at least point that somebody, whoever on this list made that personal choice, that that's their decision. And I can't fault anybody for that, but we just have to deal with the, the reality of Yes. So I, I don't because it impacts a remote learning plan K to 12 too. And it impacts special ed hubs and it impacts CTE hubs. Mm -hmm. And it impacts our ability to put a tiered process in place to begin to bring kids back kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and the timeline to do that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we have been working on a remote learning plan since May, June. In fact, um, Elena Tahal shared with um, the leadership team today the remote learning handbook for staff, which is which we would be happy to send to the board tonight. So you could take a look at it as well. Please, Dr. Tahal, you do that. We have a best practice remote learning plan ready to go and professional development has has been involved we've been providing professional development for that plan since june in fact a lot of the strategies that are being embedded in that plan is what our extended school year team used right um you know so we have we've been working simultaneously on on two plans since may or june Mm -hmm. And I think you've, I think to that point, I, you know, I would think like in June, you know, I think that the, the thought was we're going to come back in person, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the fall will come, people might get sick. And so you, we're going to have to eventually go remote. I think the kink in this is not realizing that we would have staffing issues that would just sabotage it, that we couldn't go in person right away. Yeah. You know, because again, I understood that you've always been working on remote because you you had to because mm -hmm. after the spring, right? We knew that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. They, right, because nobody knew what. Like, like Dr. Warner has always said, it, every day something new comes down. So you had to be prepared for the worst possible scenario, and that is the worst possible scenario: is that no one can come back. But if you would share that with the board, I know it's still, we're still doing some wordsmithing and stuff, but it's very well done. Which is also why I think that the point is we want our staff to come back and if we need to, to be in, in here teaching remotely because we can't be. They need home. to work. We, we promised our, our families that we're going to give them a different delivery system than we did in the spring. And that requires everybody all in. Yeah, and it was asynchronous. This will be synchronous. So it's a higher quality. Thing. To be fair, I want you to know that you don't have the votes yet to do it with them. Thank you. I, mean, I appreciate knowing that. Five okay. Okay. And if thank you. If that if that comes out, then what we'll have to have a discussion about on Monday is then what's your solution, right. and how would we do it? At this point. At this point, I feel like we are giving in. I understand Michelle's points. Yeah. And I appreciate her voicing that because she needs to. But if we vote to do way down, then we have given in on our side. And we have screwed with the public. I'm not going to do that. Okay. I don't want the but, teachers to screw the public. If anybody's going to screw them. Okay, but, but then we yeah, have to I give direction to. I might plan for another way, but if it's going to come down, that's not going to be. Okay, that's okay. Understood. I mean, and there's five people that are saying that right now, which might change. Okay. And plenty of public members that want to come. Okay, then, then we do then have to give direction to Michelle I, I on what the, what the plan is and what we'd be asking her to deliver after being told just, that they can't. I'm just saying where you are right now, you don't have five. Okay. 
Appreciate knowing. Yeah. Going into Monday night. Okay. Uh, it's just past eight. Does anybody have anything else? I think uh, if we have questions for the Chester County Health person, email them to you. Yep. If you would send them to me, I'll send them on to Jeannie. Thank you. I, I don't really care. Yeah. yeah, 12 in the last 30 days. I've been watching it every day. And the, and, the, and the issue. I don't like them, but that's. But we still, we have one thing at the end of the day. We have a vote. Yeah, but you, you have a vote, but we have to have an approach to solve. And just voting no on Monday won't give a solution to the district. You guys like to micromanage schools, and I, I have a different philosophy on that. At the end of the day, the board member has one thing to have a vote. If I vote one way or another, then that's, that's the well, end of the day. Here's the, I'm not going to get in and manage schools. Then, then why not just say um, we direct the staff to open the school and direct instruction in whatever way they can make possible. And that's the broad board statement. I mean, do you see what they My, what I just keep going to is I just keep looking at, like I said, it goes across to all the states. How many people are gonna lose their jobs? Mm -hmm. How many kids are gonna be either left at home to do this on their own? It's- How much child abuse? I mean, it's just, I mean, we've well, been you know, there for 30 from the Pediatric Association, all this stuff saying they have to get back. And it's just, I know I'm not, you know, I'm not pointing this towards, it's just a broad based whole thing. And it's just, it's to the point, it is breaking my heart. And it's yeah. just eating me up inside to the point, it is just, it's all that I think about anymore. And it's just, and I'm, my heart's just breaking for these kids and for the families who are going to have to make these decisions to either work or work, or keep the kid at home, lose my house, not feed the kids, whatever it's going to be. And this is just, just, I, I don't know. The other thing I know is that, you know, if this isn't happening to just schools, this is going to be happening to every business. I mean, I know what's happening in my business because I have friends who have young kids and their school's announced virtual. They don't know what they're going to do. And they're going to have to start relying on that CARES Act as well because they're not going to have a choice either. There's, there's a lot of parents, I mean, that are in this situation. It's not just our teachers. It, you know, so, I mean, you know, and it's about trying to figure out the solutions really to, to work with it because, uh, if you don't have the staff, you can, you know, how, how can any business operate? And they're going to be dealing with that stuff too. And I know, and I know, Jerry, you don't like it. None of us like what's going on. No, of course no one does. Everybody wants normal. There is no normal anymore. And we all have to understand that, you know, and come to terms with it and try to figure out how to navigate it. And that's what they're, and I know that's what, I mean, that's what Dr. Warner is trying to do. There's, you know, and, this, and, this, and the, the team is trying to figure out how to navigate it, you know. It's, it, it's, it's the worst, it's so difficult. We all know this. And frustrating, we know that too. Anything else? Okay. Meeting will conclude then. Um, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, we had a lot of uh, comments in the chat. We'll save all those and uh, distribute them. Um, and uh, I guess we'll see you on Monday. Ready to vote? We'll be here. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.